Good evening and welcome to our rectory study. Tonight we are going to be looking uh, at the Gospel of Mark, but in a very particular way. And one of the reasons I'm deciding to do this is next week I'm going to be running a session for some students in grades 10 to 12. And I thought, what's a way I can help connect scripture and good exegesis with modern practice, which I think is, is an important thing. So, like I say, tonight I'm looking at Mark, the Christian guide to non-violent resistance. And I want to start by saying I don't think that some of the philosophical concepts that have come later were necessarily front of mind for Mark. Rather, what we can see when we read Mark is a, is a groundwork for some of the philosophies that come later on. So, just getting our history in order there. Now, when I'm talking about Mark, I'm talking about the first gospel that was written. Uh, and I'm which was written approximately 70 CE, 70 Common Era. Uh, sometimes people say 70 AD, uh, which was shortly before the destruction of the temple, but would have had some. Uh, they might have known what was coming, uh, at least had something of an idea. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm taking the shorter form of Mark's Gospel. And I think that's an important uh, thing to say. If you weren't aware, Mark's Gospel has three endings. So there's the long ending, which most of us are familiar with. And then there's sort of a shorter ending that doesn't even have, always have verse numbers. And then the shortest ending doesn't have either of those two. And the thing that marks it is there is reference to the resurrection and there's no resurrection appearance. And uh, what I want to do is I want to avoid the, the language of the triumphalist resurrection. So, first gospel written, taking the shorter form. When I use the term Christian in my title, The Christian Guide to Nonviolent Resistance, there are two ways we can understand what it means to be a Christian, and usually they are melded together, uh, but not always. And in this particular instance, I am taking it to mean one who uh, is a practitioner or has is involved in the faith of Jesus, more than faith in Jesus. And that preposition makes a big difference. So uh, it's, it's dynamic, it's practice-based. It's not a question of what do you think about the fundamental Christological nature of Jesus, but putting into practice what is seen in the life of Jesus. So it's dynamic and it's practice based. It's not driven necessarily by certain ideas about who Jesus was ontologically. So by that I mean you could be a Christian in the first sense of the word, someone who, who tries to live like Jesus lived. Jesus is your model. Um, and not necessarily have any ideas of Jesus being God with us. So the two are not mutually exclusive, but they're also not mutually inclusive. And when I talk about nonviolent resistance, I, I, I'm looking particularly at, at, at a sort of a political context. I'm not looking at pacifism. Now, there's a long, rich, good history of Christian pacifism, of pacifism in general. Uh, 
but nonviolent resistance takes some of those ideas and it's looking at how might they impact on uh, exploring changes to structures. Um, so it's it nonviolent resistance is about a nonviolent resistance to a an unjust structure or political regime, for example. It's not talking about nonviolence in terms of uh, some of the a nonviolent response necessarily to some of the random acts of, of violence that can happen. So in this particular instance, I'm limiting the term violence to the application of physical force. Now, violence can be a much broader thing, obviously. There can be structural and systemic violence. There can be uh, spiritual violence. There can be a whole range of things. But yeah, for now, uh, I'm limiting it to the idea of physical force. And um, nonviolence is the potential for deliberate and autonomous human response. Now, autonomous in this instance is using a kind of a technical term, and it means it means non-instinctual. Uh, so, it it means using our minds, our ideas, to override our instinctive responses. Most of the things we do in life are actually quite instinctual. We don't think about them. Uh, you know, you're driving the car, something happens, you put your foot in the brakes. You don't think about it. Um, you see an ad for an ice cream and you have this thing that goes, oh, an ice cream would be nice. And we don't even pull that ad apart very often. So autonomous is about the exertion of our moral will over our instinctual responses. So it's, it's that moral exertion, that, that making a choice, a moral choice to engage in non-violence. Uh, and it can it's it's used for achieving goals, social change, those sorts of things, and it it, it ha carries with it a range of tools, of technologies, of techniques. So there can be protests, symbolic or or, or, or realized. There can be civil disobedience, uh, non cooperation, which would include things like refusing to pay taxes. Uh, as long as yeah, that, that can be a form of nonviolent resistance. And um, if you, I mean, you may have heard, um, you, you may know the story of Mahatma Gandhi uh, and his nonviolence. And the term there is Satyagraha. I think I pronounced that correctly, but if I didn't, I apologize. And it translates as truth force. And it's the absolute holding to the truth of a situation uh, and, and valuing that over and above your own physical safety. In fact, understanding that your own physical safety might be in service of the truth. Um, so so yeah, some ideas around nonviolence and the scapegoating mechanism. Uh, and, and for me, whenever I use the scapegoating mechanism, I'm working with René Girard and his definition. And René Girard looks at society. He's, amongst other things, an anthropologist. And he looks at societies and he sees this mechanism whereby violence starts to brew in a structure. And, and, and it it should it would start to look like it's going to be what they say a war of all against all everyone's out for number one and then the the mechanism is that that violence is all turned and focused on one person uh, and that person is the scapegoat Rene Girard makes very clear that it can only truly operate as a way of taking the violence out of the structure for a time if it is unconscious, if you're aware of what's going on, it doesn't work. And if you have built into the system the idea that the scapegoat is innocent, fundamentally innocent, not just innocent of the particular crime that he's being blamed for, but fundamentally innocent, it doesn't operate. So there's a whole range of concepts in there. 
And they, they, they kind of all tie together. And what I want to do now is I just want to take you through some of the uh, passages in Mark and explore how they might illuminate what nonviolence means. So the first section I'm looking at there is symbolic actions. And Mark, as the author, comes out of the gate swinging, uh, metaphorically speaking, in a nonviolent way. <laughs> he comes out swinging in a nonviolent way uh, by saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, gospel translates as good news. But if you know its historical context, it's a deeply political statement because the gospel was a term used by Romans to share the news of what was going on in the kingdom. And it was a, it was a term that was tied to the Roman Empire. So, so Mark says the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of of a new structure as differentiated against the structure of the Roman Empire. It is a very clear symbolic gesture. So rather than being good news, our soldiers have defeated the Picts or the Barbarians or the Gales or whoever the Romans were fighting with that week. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a very powerful symbolic action. Jesus. Uh, so the Gospels are obviously, obviously focused around Jesus. And when we see Jesus as the, the main character, we see that there are times when he acts in a very symbolic fashion as well. Many of the miracle stories are symbolic and the pairing up of the, of the miracle stories in Mark's Gospel, symbolic. Uh, but what I chose is one of the sea crossings. So it's Mark 4.39. And he, Jesus, so Jesus is in the boat. This is the, this is the story where he's asleep and the disciples are starting to get worried because the storm brewing. And, like, and they wake him up and they say, don't you care? Which is an interesting thing. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. So, Lot to unpack in that simple sentence. One is wind, breath, uh, spirit are all connected. But this is a spirit that's not the spirit of God because Jesus rebukes it. So it's a it's a spirit of chaos. Uh, and what Jesus does by rebuking it is he demonstrates the emptiness of the power of that destructive chaotic force. Now, in Mark's gospel, all the bad guys, in a sense, can be lumped together. So the spiritual bad guys, the, um, the religious bad guys, the military and economic bad guys, they can all be lumped together. They are various facets of the same problem. Uh, and we also see, so taking that idea, all the bad guys are, in one sense, one bad guy. Uh, in Mark 5, 12, uh, and this is the story. So Jesus has crossed over the water and he's in the non-Jewish territories. And there is a person who is uh, afflicted by demons. And, and Jesus speaks to the demon and it, it doesn't want to, it wants, uh, and, he, and he asks it its name. And the demon says, Legion. Now, of course, Legion is straight away going to be referencing the Roman legions. So here we have spiritual evil being very closely tied to um, military evil and religious evil because it's on the other side of the water. It's in the place that the religious structures don't recognize as sacred. Um, and then and then to drive it home, Mark, as a gospel writer, is not subtle. So to drive home 
the uncleanness of these spirits and the Roman legion connection, they, they beg to enter into the swine and then they go into the water. So the, the swine, pigs, the boar was the symbol for the Roman or a symbol for uh, Roman legionaries. And it was obviously ritually unclean for, for Judaism. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. Uh, and the, the spirits enter into the chaotic waters. We get this very rich symbolism that demonstrates uh, the emptiness of, emptiness of the power of violence and an alternative structure. Very, very powerful stuff. Okay. Now I want to um, hope you're keeping up. This is, there's a lot of stuff here. I, I do, did I say this? I posted the notes if you want to go back and have a look at them. And the other thing, of course, is online. It always just lives there. Um, and it'll go to YouTube eventually when I get that far. So, uh, Satyagraha, oh, um, Truth Force, is the commitment to the value of truth over uh, life. Uh, oh, um, yeah, yes, uh, you're very much right. So I've just had a comment come up and I'll come back to that. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, um, the, the commitment to truth, to truth is so powerful. Uh, that it, it becomes a statement of who you are. It becomes uh, a part of, you know, it becomes more important than any other thing about yourself, including your own well-being. The truth trumps violence. And being on the side of truth makes you more powerful than the most powerful armies ever. Um, so although they may destroy your body, um, they, they cannot destroy the truth. So, now, um, where does Mark as an author show this? It's a little tricky sometimes to see the hand of the author because Mark is, there's not a lot of um, commentary that, he, that Mark includes, but there is very careful placement of narrative and so when you look at the, the way the stories are put together, uh, you can certainly see a, the, the hand of the author and, and the message of the author. So um, if you recall the story where Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? Um, and Peter says, you are the Messiah. Now, in the other Gospels, this is seen as, oh, good on you, Peter, you, you figured it out. But in... Mark's gospel, it's immediately there is a kind of a rebuke. Don't tell people that. And then he turns to the crowd and he called and the disciples and he says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. So what's going on here? Jesus doesn't say that Peter's wrong in identifying him as the Messiah. Rather, what he's pointing to is this picture of the Messiah that most people have, which is as a political alternative to the Romans, or as a spiritual alternative perhaps to the temple, uh, is, is wrong. Because what you get is you get a buying into the, the power and violence structures. In order to overthrow the Romans, you need a bigger army, or you need better soldiers, or you need better equipment. You need to Accept the story that power is what's in control. So it's not that Peter's wrong. It's just that Peter's picture of what the Messiah is, is quite possibly wrong. And certainly the crowd around will have the different picture. And so Jesus says, you must take up your cross. Now, we often talk about, you know, taking up your cross um, in a variety of contexts. For Mark's listeners... They knew what that meant. That meant take up the instrument of your own torture and death and carry it. Be seen as the one for whom life is less important than the proclamation of truth. Uh, and it's, it's a very powerful statement. 
And this is what the Messiah is coming to represent. Okay, next one. So where do we see Jesus um, with this commitment to truth? Um, do you remember the story of the young man uh, who comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, Oh, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Uh, and my entire life I've kept, you know, um, all the commandments. And Jesus doesn't say rubbish, which he could. No one keeps all the commandments. Um, uh, instead, what he does is he says to him, and he loved him. Now, this is important because uh, truth is about a proclamation of love. It, it's not about, uh, you know, hating your, your, your enemy. It's about loving them and, ho and hoping desperately that they will see the truth and be transformed. So Jesus looked at him and loved him. You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. You see, this person, this young man is wealthy in Mark's gospel. He's got many assets, which means that this lovely, friendly, sociable young man is part of the problem of oppression of the poor. He is a landowner. He's wealthy. He's, he's probably inherited that from his, his parents. Um, and so he is part of the problem. And, and so Jesus, in challenging him, not on, oh, you haven't really followed all the commandments or anything like that, but challenging him on, the, on his place in the structure of violence, um, reveals the truth of the conflict that is built into uh, the economic structure. And is revealed in the choice that he offers. Jesus doesn't say no. He doesn't say it. He says, do this thing. Give up your position of power and, and authority and violence. And then we're in a different position. Okay. So where do we see the antagonists for, for Jesus um, quite clearly displaying uh, a re relationship to truth that might be less than exemplary? In Mark 14, so we're getting towards the end of the gospel, uh, we get the, the leaders plotting to kill Jesus. And what they say is not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. You see, they know the truth. They know the truth that Jesus is popular, and uh, particularly amongst the masses, as opposed to amongst the, the elite. They know that. And so rather than uh, work to, to undermine him or to, to take over or, or any of those sorts of things, um, they, they plot. They do this in secret. And Mark's writing of this demonstrates that they are uh, separated out from the path of truth. Uh, very clearly. Very clearly. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to, on to as a sort of a, a framework, what's called revelatory violence. So in nonviolent resistance... It's probably a misnomer, a misnaming, because there's a recognition that there may well be violence. But the idea is that the violence will be enacted by the power and authority structures in such a way as to reveal the inherent weaknesses in the position and in their system. So, um, you know, picture a, a really old system of slaves and owners and the, the slaves perhaps choose not to work and the owners come out and they whip them and beat them what they're demonstrating is that although they have the tools of violence without the slaves they are weak and that they have no moral authority it's all about physical violence when we do it in a modern system part of what what the goal is is that um, the is that people will, like the public, if you will, will see the violence, and they will react against it. Say, and see the violence perpetrated to the non-violent, and they will, in seeing that, will see the flaws in the system. So, revelatory violence is violence that breaks open the system, 
So it's the opposite of violence of two war armies coming together, which conceals the violence, conceals the structural problems, um, by being able to believe that one army is inherently better, that there's one at fault. No, no, revolutionary violence says the whole problem is armies. So, um, Mark then is telling this, the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. So we write towards the end, um, Mark 15, 37 and 38. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Remember, breath, spirit, ruach, the, the vibrancy of God exits Jesus. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, the curtain of the temple um, separates the Holy of Holies from uh, the place where people could come and worship and things like that. And what is being revealed is that that structure of separation, of having certain times and people who were in, and which means others were out, uh, is also being revealed. And is being exposed, as being connected, as being it, the, the curtain in a sense is implicit in the death of Jesus, in a sense. Now the curtain is the curtain and what it stands for symbolically is very much a part of uh, the death of Jesus. Now I want to be very clear that this isn't a, an anti-Jewish thing or even an anti. Uh, temple thing. It's an anti the structures that are inherent in most ideological religious systems. So this isn't about, oh, the temple was bad and the church is fabulous, or the temple is bad and the synagogues are wonderful, or the temple was bad and um, the, the um, you know, uh, Corinth, um, the temple to Artemis was, in Corinth was uh, in Ephesus was wonderful. Sorry, I just had to remember which people go where. Um, no, it's it's actually a re re violence revealing the implicitness of religious structures in oppression. Uh, and and you know, it, it, in the same context, the Christian Church would takes much the same role as the Jewish Church, uh, the Jewish religion took then and it probably would have been us who was involved structurally in the crucifixion of Jesus which is a bit concerning so okay so we see this this narrative device of Marx to use violence to reveal the truth um, going back in the story a little bit just so I can follow my table along uh, Mark 15, 12 to 13, so Jesus is last supper, gone out, prayed, been arrested, dragged before Pilate. Pilate has then spoken to me, now he's out, Pilate is out talking to the crowds. What do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? The crowd shouts back, crucify him. You remember when I spoke about scapegoating, how it, the system goes from a structure of all against all, and the Jews should have been against Pilate, who should have been against Herod. But there's this strange alchemy, if you will, of psychology, where suddenly it all, it all focuses on the one, and it becomes all against one. And that's crucify him. And in this legal structure, um, what what's happening is Jesus is revealing the scapegoat mechanism. So the violence that is perpetrated against Jesus, particularly as Jesus is innocent, structurally innocent, pulls back the, the covers on this mechanism. And so you get scapegoating revealed. And in its revelation, it beca it's revealed, in its very revelation, it becomes powerless. It's still a system that's used all over the place, all over the world. It's used in playgrounds. Uh, you know, kids are, I'm not talking to you, it's all his fault, it's all her fault, all the kids gang up on one person, or all the countries gang up on one country, or it's, it's all 
whoever's fault. Scapegoating still happens. But when you're aware of the system and its pervasiveness, it loses its power. Um, and its power isn't to bind people. Its power is to expunge the violence in the structure. So that's its, its power. The, the next one, so we're going to shoot forward in the story now. We actually go pick up just after uh, the curtain tears. And this is the story of the centurion standing at the base of the cross. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw in the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. And a lot of people um, sort of make of it that there's this uh, idea, if you will, that in doing this, the centurion essentially becomes the first Christian uh, or, or, or something like that. But Chad Meyer, whose work has been very useful in, in this entire piece, uh, points out that he's still a centurion. He's still doing his job. He has seen the truth and turned his back on it. He's, he was facing the truth and chose not to see it. So in, in choosing not to see, he reveals his own commitment to the structures and the violence that are going on there. So that's quite a lot of space where we see where Mark's gospel uh, operates as a guide for nonviolence. Now, nonviolence in the Christian tradition has had a number of uh, proponents, a number of people who have, who have recognized its spiritual authenticity, authenticity and power. Uh, and one of the most famous has got to be Martin Luther King. And he... Uh, proposes six principles of nonviolence, and I just want to take you through them very quickly. So the first is that one, his first principle is that one can resist evil without resorting to violence. In fact, I would suggest that one cannot resist evil by resorting to violence in this structural sense. Second, that nonviolence seeks to win the friendship and understanding of the opponent, not to humiliate him. So remember the story of Jesus talking to the, the young man? He's speaking with love in his heart. He's not trying to humiliate him. He's trying to reveal the truth. Third, evil itself, not the people committing evil acts, should be opposed. And in Mark's gospel, we see how all the opponents are kind of in a, in, a, in a sense, tied together, and they're seen as being dark spiritual forces, demonic forces. And it's the, that, rather than the, the puppets of the system, and even the emperor is a puppet of the system, uh, who are to be opposed. And, and that's an important thing to remember when you think of these sorts of things. Even the emperor is a puppet of the system. Fifth, nonviolent resistance avoids external physical violence, so no bashing people up, and internal spiritual violence of the spirit as well. It's not, a, um, it's not about refusing to just shoot your opponent or bash them up or stick them with a spear, depending on where you are in history, but it's also about refusing to hate them. It's about recognizing that, it's, in a sense, the centurion is as much a victim of the system or at least is as much controlled by the system as everyone else that is put on the cross. It's the non-violent resistor who is, in fact, free from the system. The sixth principle is that the non-violent resistor must have a deep faith in the future, stemming from the conviction that the universe is on the side of justice. And right at the beginning, I said I'm taking the shorter version of Mark's gospel, which doesn't have the an actual resurrection scene. It, it, it doesn't have any of the disciples seeing Jesus. And I think that's really important because what we get is we get um, the idea that the, the, messi the Messiah becomes the Messianic community. The resurrection is in the overcoming of death and violence and about being committed to... Uh, polity, a, a way of living alongside each other that isn't tied to the structures and systems 
of violence that isn't bound by a fear of death. So, that's my introduction to why Mark is a good, well, that's my argument, if you will, as to why Mark is a good guide to non-violence for, for the Christian. Um, yeah. I, I feel like there was a lot there. Hopefully it was interesting. So, um, one comment that came up that I wanted to go back to is being on the sea, uh, water seen as chaos and disorder and the wind, uh, wind of disruption over the water of chaos. Um, so, referencing when the disciples were on the boat and Jesus was asleep. And it's no wonder they were worried. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I suspect that in a sense, this might also be Mark saying that their fear is, is, is giving into the structure um, of, of kind of conflict and violence. And then they see that the, the winds are a greater army than, than the boat in which they find themselves. Um, maybe, just thinking off the top of my head. Uh, I think that was it in terms of questions and things. Um, and I'm going to say thank you. Uh, we, that was quite a long one, actually. So I'll transfer that to YouTube at some stage. Good evening. God bless. And uh, I'll see you around. One thing. Next week, we're not going to have a session because I'm going to be uh, looking after some 60 or so kids. Or one of the people looking after the kids. And tonight's session, I'm hoping to to take them through that as well. So that should be fun. But I think that means two, two weeks off because then we've got a parish council at some stage. Oh, thank you. Good night and God bless.